All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Eric, and today we're going to talk a bit about uh, G1 concepts and performance tuning. But before we begin, I'm going to let this slide hang out there for a few awkward seconds for all of you to enjoy. All right, let's have a look at uh, today's agenda. We're going to start off by looking at three important properties when it comes to garbage collection, throughput, latency, and footprint. We're then going to move on to see how you can measure the JVM and the garbage collector. After that, we're going to get into some tuning. And in the end, we're going to talk a little bit about the community. But first, who am I up here? I'm Eric. I like to program garbage collectors. I work at Oracle in the JVM garbage collection team and has done so for approximately six years. And for the past three years, I've worked on the G1 garbage collector. And I'm also a reviewer and frequent committer to OpenEDK. So let's get into our first point for today, throughput, latency, and footprint. Uh, these three important properties uh, can roughly be defined as, uh, for throughput, the number of requests per second. So if you have a web server or some other backend service, the number of requests you can handle per second. Uh, for latency, you can think of that as the maximum time for a request. And for footprint, well, that's usually considered as the memory usage of a Java process. And we're going to look about look a little bit more on each of these ter properties in detail. So for throughput, uh, we usually measure that as the total running time of uh, the Java process. And when it comes to garbage collection, it can differ a bit between different GCs how much they contribute to the total running time. Some collectors are going to pause so and stop the Java application. And these pauses are, of course, going to contribute to the total running time of the program. But there's also some more subtle differences. Uh, GCs can do different optimizations during a pause, and also while your program is running. So different collectors can result in shorter or longer total running time for the same workload. And when it comes to throughput, you usually care about that when you have more batch kind of like workloads. For example, when you compile your Java source code with Java C, you don't really care too much how long the JVM is paused during the compilation. You just want your source code to be comp compiled as quickly as possible. Also, you might have offline uh, big data jobs running, or you have some scientific computation, where you're not really interacting with the program. You just tell it to start, and you want to get the result back. Uh, usually, we measure this as, the, again, the total running time or the output during a time unit, for example, requests per second or something similar. The second property we're going to talk a little bit about is latency. I know a lot of you in here are probably concerned about this. Uh, usually, this comes up when you have a service, such as a network service, or we have some backend service, and you have a, often you measure the request time. So how long, if a user wants to see your web page, how long time from that they load the, start to load the page until they get a result back. This is very important. And uh, often you see diagrams such as the one on the slide, where on the x-axis you have the time, on the y-axis you have the request time. Uh, and GC contributes to this, or <laughs> is a problem when it comes to this, because if the garbage collector decides to pause your application, that means it will contribute to the request time. And usually, when we talk about latency, we have to think a little bit more when we quantify it. Uh, what we often do is that we sort the request times from longest to shortest. And notice I dropped the label on the x-axis. This is just a sorted number of request times now. And um, then we can start to quantify what it means uh, to have uh, lower or higher latencies. Now we can say, for example, well, 95% of my requests finished in 50 milliseconds or shorter. And of course, we can do the same thing when it comes to the garbage collection pauses. We can measure the GC pauses. And note there, it's not always the case that the longest request had the longest GC pause. There are a bunch of other things contributing to the time of a request. There could be network latencies. There can be I.O. going on. You might have to read something from disk that contributes. But we can, of course, do the same thing when it comes to GC process as we did with request types. We can sort them from longest to shortest. And now we can start to quantify properties about our GC post times, saying, for example, well, 90% of my GC process were shorter than 10 milliseconds. And when it comes to latency, you often care about that when you have interactive workloads. For example, if you're trying out the new Yeshell tool in JDK 9, and you type some expression into Yeshell, you don't want to wait for a long time until you get the answer back. You want to see it immediately and get responsiveness. Uh, also, network services, uh, again, a, some kind of uh, web backend. 
you care about the request coming back to the user quickly. And also in graphical applications, if you're rendering things with a frame rate, you don't want a frame to take too long time because it will cause slug slagginess to your application. And uh, when we measure this, we usually talk a bit about the percentile of a time unit. For example, the 95th percentile is 50 milliseconds. That means that 95% of my pauses were shorter than 50 milliseconds. And uh, the last property we're going to see a little bit about is uh, footprint. And here we see a little bit of an X-ray of a Java process going on and what contributes to the memory usage of such a Java process. Of course, the bulk of the memory usage is probably going to be the Java heap itself, which contains lots and lots of Java objects. But there's also other things going on, such as uh, the C heap or the native heap that the JVM can use to allocate data structure that it needs to support its algorithms. Uh, there might be anonymous pages mapped in with MMAP. Uh, there will, of course, also be jitted code that also takes up space for your process and some other things going on. And when it comes to GC, it also contributes to this because different algorithms might uh, result in uh, sl smaller or larger heaps. Uh, different GC algorithms can also consume more or less native memory in order to support its algorithms uh, and also some MMAP pages, etc. And if you are concerned about footprint, you are probably working in a bit more memory constrained environment. For example, you might want your program to run on a Raspberry Pi, an IoT device, but it's also starting to sort of become popular or a frequent problem again when it comes to containers, and you want to pack a lot of JVMs or containers onto a single machine. And uh, we usually measure this as the memory usage of a process in megabytes or gigabytes. So uh, the problem here is that it's usually hard to optimize for all these properties at the same time. Uh, often you have a trade-off. You can optimize for one or two of them, but then you will have to sacrifice the third one a bit. Uh, sometimes there are some golden optimizations, but that is not too common. What's very important is that you define uh, success and what it means for your program to perform well in terms of your own application. Uh, for example, if I'm serving up a web page, then I might say that, well, all my users visiting my web page, or at least 99.9% .9 of them, should get a web page back in 300 milliseconds. Or the program should run, run on a small Raspberry Pi Zero, or the big data analysis job should finish in four hours. These are properties of your own programs. No one cares if you have a very blazingly fast JVM, but your program runs slow. What's important is that your program is fast, uh, and if that means you have to tune the JVM, that might be it, but please, Remember, it's all about how the user perceives the application of your performance, not the JVM itself. So we looked a little bit about these three properties, and now we're going to see how we can get some data out of the JVM. So performance problems can come from any layer in the stack. Uh, you have your own application which might have data structures, libraries, algorithms that perform suboptimally. Uh, the JVM itself, of course, that is uh, running your application, might have problems with the JIT, with locking, with synchronization, with GC. The operating system, the kernel, you might see problems with the schedulers, with uh, transparent huge pages, locking again. Uh, you might have problem with the C library in the user space of your OS that performs suboptimally. And finally, you can also, of course, have problems with the hardware itself. Maybe you have outdated firmware that doesn't have all the latest performance enhancements. There might be problems with virtualization, memory bandwidth, etc. But for this talk, we're going to focus on the JVM, and particularly the GC. But if you really want to achieve maximum performance, you're going to have to take your whole system into account and look at various other things. So if we want to know more about the JVM, how can we get some data out of it? Well, we have two main options here. We have Java Flight Recorder, which is enabled by the flag dash xx start flight recording. Uh, this will result in a binary recording, a binary format. And you choose which events you want to subscribe to, subscribe to and get the data of that in the recording. And that recording can later be viewed, usually in Java Mission Control. You can also use uh, text-based logging. Uh, in JDK 9, you have the new unified logging that was introduced behind the flag dash x log. Uh, the logs are in text format. And here, when you choose what the kind of data you want to measure, uh, you use tags and levels to describe what information you want to get out of the JVM. And of course, these text files can be viewed in any editor of your choice. And we're going to look a bit more deeply into those two options uh, in turn. And let's start with 
Java Flight Recorder. So with Flight Recorder, today in JDK 9, you will write Java XX unlock commercial features, and then start flight recording, give it a file name, recording.jfr in this example, and then run your application. Uh, after your application is done, if you do ls in the same directory, you will find the recording.jfr in there. And the recordings, the data you get in them are event-based. You choose which kind of events you want to subscribe to and get that data in the recording. You can select these events in a JFC settings file. And in JDK9, you can also create your own events. That is new for JDK9. And this is a very powerful feature. You can create events in your application that will end up in the same recording as events from the JVM itself. So you can correlate. Maybe you can see that you create an event when you start to do your report and analysis job. And you see that when you got that event, you also got an event uh, saying that, uh, for example, the GC took too long time, or et cetera. And now you can very easily correlate between these two events happening and see that, well, this was maybe the cause and this was the effect. Uh, recordings are viewed in uh, Java Mission Control, or JMC for short. Uh, JMC 6.0 was released alongside Oracle JDK 9. And you can use the Java Mission Control to start recordings. You don't have to use the command line. Uh, you can use JMC to get the recordings going. You can also, in JMC, configure which events you want to get data from. And uh, in starting in JMC 6, you will also get automatic analysis of your recordings. So JMC has a rules engine that can deduce what has been going on based on the events in the recording. And if you want more information, see oracle.com slash mission control for more details about JMC. And here's a screenshot uh, showing what the JMC looks like when we look a bit more into detail at the garbage collection information. Logging, the other choice for getting data out of the JVM. Uh, so JDK9 introduced a new flag, dash xlog, and the unified logging framework. So the format for the options to enable loggings is in simplified form, dash xlog. You select a tag. You select which level you want the information on that tag. And you tell uh, the login subsystem where the login should end up, on STD out, STD R, or in a file, perhaps. Uh, for an example here on the slide, we see that uh, I want uh, for all messages tagged with GC, I want the info level on those. Uh, if there are messages tagged with GC plus faces, I want the debug level on those. And for safe, all messages tagged with safe point, I want them on the trace level. And I want all of this in the file gc-log.txt. For more details on this uh, command line flags and how to specify the syntax, you can see JEP 158 on openedk.java.net slash JEP slash 158. And uh, for an example, what the output looks from a log, here I'm just enabling GC. And since the default level is info, I will now get all messages tagged with GC on the info level. And then you also run your application. And uh, to start out, we see that for each line, I get a few decorations. So the first columns are, in this case, you get a timestamp. When was this log message written? Uh, you will see the level. So I'm running with the default level, which is info. So all my lines have the info level. I'm also getting logs that are tagged with GC and only GC. So here I'm getting uh, see which tags this message has. And of course, it's only GC. And then the message itself. And here, the JVM is telling you that you are now running with G1. Looking into a bit more what a GC post looks like on this uh, kind of logging level, you again see the timestamp, the info level, the GC tag. And then we come into the actual log message. And for each log message, you will get a GC ID. Here for the first one is zero. They don't have to come in a consecutive order. It is just an identifier. Of course, we will see later there might be more log lines for a single GC. And then the ID helps you to identify which lines belong to which garbage collection post. Uh, it tells you what kind of post this was. This was a young post, apparently, and we will see what that is. Uh, the reason for the post, this was an evacuation post. The heap usage before the post, after the post, and uh, the capacity, how much uh, memory could have grown to. And uh, the thing most of you are concerned about, the length of the post itself. All right, so we looked at how to get data out of the JVM and do some measurements. Now let's get in a little bit more into tuning. So tuning often starts with a problem that you're noticing. Maybe you, a request took too long time when you had in your performance lab. Uh, you discovered that the CPU of one of your servers is 100% utilized, or the Java process threw one out of memory, and you need to understand why and what happened and what is going on in there. So in all these cases, uh, I usually apply the method of first I measure, 
to see what has been going on. Then I need to understand why was this happening. And when we have the data and we have an understanding of the problem, then we can often tune around it and solve the issue. But uh, first things first, uh, when you start to tune and start to measure, and you want to optimize something, use a minimal number of JVM flags to begin with. Uh, we see many examples where uh, people have been inheriting previous colleagues' uh, JVM flags for years, maybe in their fifth generation. There are so many flags in there, most of them might not even apply any longer. There might be conflicting flags, flags for different kind of garbage collection in the same command line. So just start out with XMX to begin with. Get a clean, fresh slate uh, when you're starting to optimize. Uh, please rely on the first-hand up-to-date information. For JDK9, my colleague Thomas just rewrote the entire uh, G1 uh, tuning guidelines. So they are freshly rewritten for 9 uh, with all the latest info. So please have a look at that document. Uh, and uh, much of this presentation is, of course, based on this. Uh, it will help you out when you are tuning. Again, G1 has been around for a long time. There are much outdated information on the web in various blogs, talks, etc. So please use up-to-date information when you start to tune. And finally, use as recent JDK as possible. This is particularly important for G1, which has improved a lot in more recent JDK releases. All right, so the problem we're going to look at today is uh, two long pauses. This is often what we hear from users that they are concerned about and want to tune. And again, why do we care about this? Well, if you have some kind of interactive application and the JVM, and in GC this case, pauses your application, uh, you will have longer request times or you will drop frames, etc. cetera. Uh, so we want to shorten these pauses in, for interactive applications. Your first uh, go-to flag here is going to be max GC pause millis. Uh, because this is the flag that, uh, in many cases, drives G1's ergonomics engines. So G1 tries to keep a pause target, and this pause target is 200 milliseconds by default. If you increase this pause target and you give it a higher value, let's say I'm, I'm fine with 500 millisecond pauses, that means you will get more throughput uh, out of uh, your application, but you will also get higher latencies because you are saying I'm fine with 500 millisecond pauses, and if you're fine with that, in turn, you will get better throughput. On the other hand, if you say that I want really short pauses, then you can decrease this value to, for example, 100 milliseconds or 80 milliseconds. Uh, that, of course, comes with a cost. There, again, these trade-offs always show up. Uh, so you will get less throughput, but on the other hand, you will also get shorter pauses. But what if setting max GC post millis isn't enough? You set it to the value you want. Here I'm running with 200 at default. But still, this pauses seems to be a bit too long. We have one at 220, one at 270, and then we have a really slow one at 400. Uh, the first thing you want to look into is what kind of pause is this, because you need to understand, in order to solve these problems, we must understand what's going on. Otherwise, we're just going to guess and set a bunch of JVM flags uh, trying randomly until something seems to work, and that won't uh, lead to any good. Uh, so again, start looking at the kind of pause. Here we see three different kinds of pauses. We apparently have one young pause, one mixed pause, and one full pause. And we're going to look at them in turn and see what we can do about these problems. So to begin with, we will see a little bit more about the young pauses. And this young pause apparently ran for a bit too long, 220 milliseconds compared to 200. And in order to solve this problem, we must remember the steps. First, we measure, and we have measured and gotten the data out. Uh, then we need to understand why is this happening, what is going on inside the JVM. And when we have this knowledge, we can tune around the problem. But do we have sufficient data in this case, or do we know enough? No, I don't think so. We need to know a bit more what a giant collection is and what is going on. So G1 splits the heap into multiple regions. You will have Eden regions and survival regions. These are common, together known as young regions. There will be three regions on the heap with no objects inside them. And there will also be old regions. An object starts out by being allocated into an Eden region. Then, after a, as it, uh, a young collection happens and it survives that young collection, it will be copied into a survival region. And if it survives multiple young collections, it will eventually end up being promoted into an old region. Looking at the heap prior to a young collection, uh, you see that all of our Eden regions have objects inside them and also the survival region. Uh, the orange objects are live. Those are the ones that are actually in use. Uh, so G1 will find these orange objects in the Eden and survival regions, the live ones, 
and it will compactly copy them into a free region and update all the references so that the world looks sane again when the, JVM, when the Java application resumes. Sorry, F is for a free region. So we, copy, we compactly copy the live objects into a free region. And afterwards, when this copying is done, uh, we will, as a result, have a, the free region turn into a survival region, and the Eden regions turn into free regions and can be once again used for allocations. As you see, we started out with one free region, and then we compactly copied four regions into one free region, and now we have four free regions. So we have, the heap is more dense, more compact, so we can reuse the memory for new allocations. So looking at this uh, pause, we now have an understanding of what is going on a bit more during a young collection. But do we have enough data? No, in this case, we don't. So we need to enable more logging. And now I'm going to say dash x log gc star. That means I want to log, log all tag sets, including the tag gc. So there might be log messages, including gc, but also other tags. And now I want all the lines with gc and potentially other tags inside them. So let's see what we get when we do gc star. Well, now we get a lot more information. And here we can see that the gc id helps us out by so we can see which lines belongs to which garbage collection. And these all belong to gc154. We can see that we still have the young pause. Uh, we're using apparently 18 workers for this evacuation, so things are being run a lot in parallel. Uh, we, there are different phases apparently. We have the pre-evacuate collection set, evacuate collection set, and post-evacuate collection set, and then some other time. We can see the region distribution prior to the collection and after the collection. So we had the 314 Eden regions prior to the giant collection, and as we now know, the Eden regions, we will compactly copy the objects into free regions, so there are zero ones afterwards. They have all become free. Uh, we had 34 survival regions going, on to the, going into the collection, and when we were done, the data resided in 32 survival regions. And the old regions increased from 415 to 449. We also got some information about humongous regions and metaspace. We will not go into that today. And finally, we get the heap usage before and after, the capacity and the time for the pause itself. So if we look a bit more closely here, we see that it seems like this phase evacuate collection set takes almost all the time. Um, we see it took 52.5 milliseconds out of 54. Uh, we also see that uh, there seems to be quite an increase in old regions, and we're also using uh, quite a bit of survival regions. So again, evacuating collection set took time. That was approximately 90-70% of the pause. Uh, many objects seem to survive. We had to use 34 new old regions and 32 new survival regions. But to really get to the bottom of this, we need even more information to finally see what happened here. So we're going to enable debug level on all log lines, including the tag GC. So let's see what we get. We're going to get a lot of output. This is not something you want to run in production. <laughs> you, you will quickly fill up the logs with a lot of info. But if you are tuning and drilling down into a specific problem, this might very well help you. And so I just copied a part of the log here. There are a bunch more information about the GC. But now we will see all the phases and their subphases listed in the log. And we will see that the phase that took a lot of time was obi copy. And now you see the phase is labeled with mean, average, max. That's because all of this is being run in parallel and concurrent at the same time. Uh, so the average time a worker spent doing obi copy was 40, approximately 49 milliseconds. And the most time a worker took was 50 milliseconds. So apparently, the pause is spent doing object copy. So what can we conclude? Well, copying objects takes time. But why did G1 has to, co had to copy so many objects for this pause? Well, most objects are supposed, most young objects are supposed to be dead. And this is based on the hypothesis that most objects either die young or they live for a very long time. Uh, if this is not true for your application, uh, you might have to tune the number of young regions that G1 can use. You might have to set the flags G1 new size percent and G1 max new size percent. Uh, perhaps you have more information about your application than G1 can deduce, because the ergonomics engines will try to find an optimum value here. But you might know something that G1 doesn't. For example, you know I'm going to generate a big, big report or something. And once the report is done, all the objects are going to die. But if G1 decides to pause before the report is done, there might be a lot of live objects around that has to be copied out. So if you just increase uh, the number of young regions a bit, uh, the objects will have more time to die, and there will be less live objects for G1 to copy. 
moving on, we will have a little bit look at uh, a mixed pause. And the good thing here is that you all now have uh, a better understanding of young collections. You can bring that knowledge over into mixed collections because they are very, very similar. Uh, the difference is that a mixed collection collects both young and old regions. And as we've already seen, uh, the young regions can be oh, there's a typo there. Uh, the young regions can be bounded with G1 max new size percent. But what about the old regions? Can you bound the number of old regions in a pause? We need to understand a bit more about mixed collections in order to answer that question. So if you look at this uh, heap on the slide here, we have a bunch of Eden regions with the orange live objects in them. Uh, we have two old regions and two free regions. And the old regions also have a few live orange objects. What G1 is going to do for a mixed collection is going to select all the young regions. Those are the Eden and Survivor ones. They always have to be collected in a pause and one or more old regions. And then it will do the same thing as in a young collection. The live objects will be compactly copied into free regions, and then the, the regions in this, uh, and then the old regions and young regions that were collected will become free regions. So again, very similar. <laughs> the code is actually almost the same uh, for a young and a mixed collection. Uh, so G1 selects a collection set of regions we can bound the young part of that collection set with G1 max new size percent. And we can bound the old part with G1 mix GC count target. Uh, G1 mix GC count target is by default 8. And that means that G1 will strive to collect all old regions during 8 mix collections. Uh, if you're looking for lower latencies, this might be a way to low value. Let's say you have 800 old regions because you have a rather large heap and you want to achieve short pauses. You don't want to copy a lot of data in each post. You want to spread the work out during many mixed collections. Well, if you have 800 old regions and you have a mixed GC count target of eight, uh, you might end up with uh, approximately 100 old regions per mixed collection if most of the regions are rather full. And this can be way too many. You will see too, way too long pauses. And then it's a good sign that you might have to increase mixed GC count target to a higher value. You can also tell G1 that uh, it doesn't have to do so much which seems a bit strange. But you can tune it to do less work uh, with the flags, for example, mixed GC live threshold percent, which by default is 85. And these flags will tell G1 when to consider collecting an old region. Because if a region is mostly filled with live objects, then we're just going to shuffle data around on the heap. We're going to move objects that are almost all them live from one region to another, as we saw on the slides. And we haven't really gained anything. I mean, the point of all these collections is to collect multiple regions with a few live objects in them into one single region so we can reuse the other regions. But if a region is almost full, well, we won't really get much memory back. And G1 mixed live, G <laughs> G1 mixed GC live threshold percent tells G1 uh, the threshold who went to consider collecting an old region. And by default, that is 85% full. If you decrease this, value. That means that G1 will skip collecting, if you set it to 65% or 55%, uh, then G1 will skip collecting uh, those uh, old regions. But this might result in more heap usage. We're going to leave more garbage lying around on the heap. The other flag is uh, G1 heap waste percent, uh, which almost says what it means in the name, uh, which allows more garbage on the heap. So this is a goal for G1. It says that I'm OK with leaving, by default, 5% of garbage lying around on the heap. If you're OK with more garbage on the heap, that means that G1 can do less work, and you can increase this value. But again, a warning, this will result in more heap usage. And again, we start to see these trade-offs. You will get shorter pauses, but perhaps more footprint. All right, we saved the worst one for last. So here we see a full uh, pause. And apparently, this took uh, way, way too long time. If we had a post target of 200, we are up at uh, 400 here. So this doesn't seem too good. What is going on here? Uh, if you see a full collection, that's a bad sign. They are not supposed to happen. This is a failure mode of G1, and it is clearly not running optimally. It is very important for you to understand why a full collection happened. Uh, the good news is that it's uh, often pretty easy to find out why a full collection happened and work around it, but it's very important that you do. If, if a full collection shows up in your log or in your JFR recording, uh, you need to get an understanding of what was going on, because this is, again, a failure mode. Uh, so in the log, you will see the pause here, the full pause at the bottom, bolded. And if you just look a little bit earlier in some of the previous lines, you will notice this little line in the previous young collection, two space exhausted. 
what could that mean? Well, during a young collection, as we've seen, G1 will try to compactly copy all the live objects into a free region. Well, what if there's a lot of live objects in the young regions and not that many free regions left on the heap? Well, we will get a two space exhausted. That means that there weren't that much space to copy the live objects into. Uh, so instead, uh, the, the Eden regions and uh, the incoming survival regions will just be turned into old regions. We won't almost free up any memory. And as a result, we will eventually, pretty soon after, run into a full collection. And here you might ask yourself, why didn't G1 do a mixed collection here? I mean, if we look again, there were a couple of old regions there. Couldn't we have collected a few of them, freed up some memory, and uh, reused that? Uh, we must understand a bit more about G1 to answer that question, understand why we didn't do what we did a junk collection and not an old collection, or a mixed collection. So on the previous slides we've seen, I only just vaguely hinted at, well, there's going to be these orange live objects, but I never really told you why they are there and how did G1 find out what was live and what wasn't live. Uh, so G1 finds live objects in young regions every time it does a junk collection. There are usually a few live objects in the young regions, so this is pretty quick, and it's done during a pause. Uh, however, for the old regions, of which are often plenty, uh, G1 will concurrently find all live objects. And this can, is called concurrent marking and can take a bit of time, especially if you have a large heap. And the good news is that this will not stop your Java application. This is running concurrently at the same time as your Java application is running. But the problem is that G1 cannot collect a region without liveness information. If it doesn't know which objects are live or dead, it can't know which space to reclaim. So mixed collections require a concurrent mark to finish. And why is that a problem? Let's have a look at an example. So as your application starts out, you will allocate objects into Eden regions. As you allocate more and more, uh, you're going to start to fill up more and more Eden regions. And G1 will decide that mm, now it's a good time to pause. You have filled up quite a few Eden regions. And during young collections, it will find all the young live objects during that pause. Uh, it will compactly copy them into a survival region, as we have seen. And as you can see on the timeline, this is a little pause where your application is paused. Uh, and then it will continue running. Now, as time goes on, more and more of these young collections will occur. And eventually, objects will start to survive more and more young collections and will be promoted into old regions. Again, time continues, more and more pauses, and now the old regions are starting to fill up as well. But from G1's point of view, they are being filled up with live objects because you can't really tell the difference at this point about the live and dead object in an old region. Now is a good time to start the concurrent mark because we need the concurrent mark to finish before we run out of free regions on the heap. So here you can see that the concurrent threads are kicked off on the time axis, uh, and it's being run at the same time as the application is running, so there's no pause in there. There might be young collections going on concurrently with the concurrent marking, so that is perfectly fine. And these young collections might promote more and more objects into old regions. So now it's getting rather heat uh, full on, and hopefully concurrent mark is about to finish soon so we can reclaim memory from old regions. And luckily enough, it just finished. <laughs> Uh, so now that concurrent mark finished, G1 finally gets the liveness information it needs and discovers, aha, there were only a few objects live in each old region. And if we go back to our problematic post that was very long, we saw at the bottom we have the long full post due to an allocation failure. We look a bit further up, we saw the two space exhausted. Okay, there weren't enough uh, survival regions for a young collection to copy the objects in two. And if we look even further up, we see that, oh, there was a concurrent cycle started and concurrent mark was kicked off. But the important thing here is what we do not see in the log, which is that we do not see that the concurrent cycle finished. Concurrent mark did not have time to finish. It didn't finish in time. So G1 couldn't get the liveness information it needed to collect the old regions. And therefore, when there were no more free regions available, it had to fall back to the failure mode of full collection. In JDK9, we introduced adaptive start of concurrent cycle. This means that we will driven by the data we gather during runtime of your application, how it behaves, uh, and our policies, we will kick off the concurrent mark threads, hopefully, in time. This is driven by the ergonomics engine. But uh, you might say that, mm, I'm really concerned about this. I really want to finish in time. So you can if uh, increase G1 reserve percent, which is by default 10, to say that, oh, OK, I, I know that you can calculate 
fairly well when to start in current market rates, but please have a buffer at the end of three regions so that you really do finish in time. And if something happens during a current marking, for example, you get your blog post on Hacker News and suddenly you have uh, too many visitors to your website and a lot of uh, objects are being allocated as a result, uh, you might need a little bit slightly larger buffer. You can also increase the heap size to give concurrent marking more headroom and more time to finish as it traverses the heap. It is very important that if you do get a full collection, that you analyze not only why it happened, but also the outcome of that full collection. Particularly if the full collection didn't free up any memory, that means that either the heap is too small, or rather you have a too large number of live objects for a heap of that size, or you might have a memory leak in your application filling up the heap with objects that shouldn't be live, but you are somehow holding on to them. Uh, looking in uh, Java Mission Control, here we see an example of the automated analysis introduced in JMC 6.0. And we see that uh, the full collections get the full 100 severity score. That means that this is a serious problem. And it also says the G1 garbage collection was used, but the JVM had to do a serial old collection. And we see that there we had a GC stall. Uh, and you need to look into this. If you think that you might have a memory leak and you're not really sure, if you see the outcome was that the heap was full and it shouldn't really be that full of objects, you can move on to the uh, allocation tab in JMC, which will tell you which objects has been allocated or which type. We'll also give you the stack traces. Where was that ob those objects allocated from? So you can do a drill down analysis and understand why did you get um, a, a full heap? And where could a memory leak come from? So uh, we looked at the three kinds of pauses. And we used the same method in all these cases. We measured, either using logging or Java Flight Recorder. We got a better understanding of how it worked by, yeah, you got it by watching this presentation. Or you can read the tuning guidelines so you know what is going on and why it could have caused the longer pause, and then we tuned to work around it and achieve better performance. So we've seen a bit about uh, the three properties, throughput, latency, and footprint. We looked how to get data from an instrument, the JVM. We've seen how we can tune around and tune for lower latencies for, the for all of young, mixed, and uh, full pauses. And now we want to talk a little bit about the community. So, if you want to engage with us, the GC developers, and also many of the performance experts and people working uh, with garbage collection and garbage collection tuning, please sign up to Hotspot GC Juice on openindicator.java.net. And uh, also, thank you to all of you who are helping, those of you that are more experienced, helping out newcomers and uh, analyzing the logs. Uh, we, the GC developers ourselves, we are also reading this list. But unfortunately, we might not always have time to answer. Uh, you can also join the OpenJDK RSC channel on irc.ofc.net if you want to chat with us. And while you're here at Java 1, please uh, stop by the Oracle Developer Lounge here in Moscone West. Uh, I'm usually around in the DevOps corner. Uh, you can learn more on openjdk.java.net or worker.com slash Java. And if you're on Twitter, please follow at openjdk or at worker, Java 1 and DevOps. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs>